nice. Hello there, everybody. So, Bar 92 AK Nightmare, and finally, welcome back to, well, DS Ire interview with Kazik Blue Bay. So, um. I'm not entirely sure how crazy the audio is, but, uh. <laughs> Needless to say, how do I, how do I, how the fuck do I describe last episode? So, Ludwig did the biting, and they did the screeching. And now all hell's gone loose. Essentially. So now it looks like the LDO is now gonna be going, they're, they're booking it, they're gonna go <laughs> the shit out of Ludwig. No, this is going to be fun. Also, it looks like we're gonna be able to finish this in maybe like three or four episodes maybe we'll have to wait and see oh and I will give some people a little bit of a notice here um, I know some people might thought I was joking but I was being serious um, the Otzi Luth is actually in progress of being made right now um, I, I guess I could technically show off a bit of a snippet of it but it's still kind of in the development phase with the artwork at least same artist that made my Biria or my Bria however the hell you want to pronounce it and it's coming along smoothly. Don't worry, I'll keep you guys up to date on that. Anyway, the location was not far from Norway's Svalbard. 75 degrees north latitude, 9 degrees east longitude, like a raging wave. It was giving chase to the Black Star. Raging wave described both its movement and the effect it left behind. While advancing with speeds greater than anything else at the time, it also left immense waves in its wake. They thundered upward, going as far as several hundred meters into the air, and there didn't seem to be an end to them. The Arctic Ocean was literally shaking, as though bombarded by an endless airstrike. On its way there, the thing that launched tsunamis in all directions created enough energy to match the most historic of earthquakes. It was a calamity that could bring some of the worst ruin ever known. Despite that, it was only the beginning. After all, the thing was merely running. Its arm, which could grasp a mountain, was simply hitting the s its oh, its arms. I I I I I failed that miserably. I'm so sorry. Once the right hand reached the bottom, it switched to the left, then back to right, and so on. This was nothing but a repeat of that action. The shining, golden, gigantic skeleton that seemed to have escaped the realm of myth was merely advancing forward as though crawling on the water. It was a sight that would rid those with normal nerves of their sanity, and yet it was very real. He's a big boy. The thing was Gladsheim Welpal, the fifth universe of gold. It was Reinhard Heydrich's creation figment, and its soul comprised of those that had passed in on the war, making it much like the Legion of Hell. Its unmatched majesty and might was witnessed by countless individuals and it caused an uproar so great that the word chaotic seemed too weak to properly describe it. But what did that matter? Secrecy? Hiding? Ridiculous. This was the march of a hegemon. There was no reason for him to humble himself for the general public. I'm his ass, skeleton! Fucking run! Hegemony wasn't true until it ascended above concepts such as modern common sense and values. It was an absolute law of a new world that consumed and recolored all there was. The idea that those who'd escaped the common world and society had to walk in the shadows was a defeatist nonsense. They couldn't win after all. They hit precisely because they would lose if their truth became known to the masses. This applied to soldiers criminals, and yes, magicians and those who, pe who people saw as inhuman. Despite claiming to know more of truths about the world than the common man, and acting as if they were above the rest, they were actually afraid of earthly society and ran from it. You could almost hear the mystic legion sing the will of its master. Such contradiction, what do we think? You sadden yet lovable frail ones. Watch as I destroy both society and what lies behind it. I shall not be defeated. Cry tears of reverent joy and extol the Dies Irae. Seek hail Victoria. My world shall be triumphant. Let me grant you the sweet joy of war. 
May all of creation be painted with the law of strife. The king of Valhalla, a man of gold, stood atop his castle with eye-pleasing beauty and an archaic smile on his visage. He lovingly gazed the darkness ahead. Oh, His refined tone contained not a hint of barbarism. The difference between him and a blood-loving berserker was far too obvious. As he claimed he would be granting nothing but love. To him, that and destruction were not but synonyms. Therefore, he had no fear or hesitation. Hegemon that he was, he would merely follow his overflowing passion and destroy all there was. As though celebrating that fact, the magician at his side lightly nodded. <laughs> Oh god, I love this song. Oh, I love this song. Oh, I love this song. Oh, I love this song. あちらは確かなところでも That's the million dollar question. Er, wait, million soul question. Ah, fuck it. Reinhardt cut his friend's words short and spoke what he wanted to know. The entity of night and dark seemed to possess qualities from both of those paradigms. Or perhaps it was better to see it as unlike either of those. The fact that it encroached with the setting sun made it seem but its territory was more or less the same size at all times, which was closer to transcendence. On the other hand, when exposed to the law of light, it easily backed away and opened the path. Transcendence was too obstinate, and hegemony was too aggressive to sport such a quality. The word primeval seemed highly fitting, as it seemed akin to the primal chaos and how it danced around definition. As though acknowledging that, Mercurius formed an implicative smile. The magician raised a finger and whispered as if caressing the dark. I think we both know exactly the correct option that we're going to be going with in this regard. <laughs> Sorry. Ooh, wouldn't that be an interesting toilet thought? He cut his words short and raised a hand before continuing as though to inspire the army waiting behind him. Hateni, 
誘えるように努力いたそう。The two looked at each other and grinned before. そういう質問<笑> Reinhard lowered his hand with an erupting fighting spirit, the Legion of Gold that had a war cry. Thus began a battle that would decide the outcome of another great war. The reigning hymn of strife roused the hell to overflow and rush toward their great foe. The dead that made up the mystic castle began separating from it and rushed at Ludwig like an avalanche. There was a lot of infantry, but that certainty wasn't, that certainly wasn't all. There were tanks, fighter aircrafts, and even battleships as well, none of which ceased to function merely because they were in midair. The limitless flood of undead formed a vast river, while the fighters flew as they were created to. The other war machines charged the enemy while crushing their own army. As though to assert their position as the final supreme arcade, They created a nightmarish sight as they advanced on the dark divinity. The sight trampled over all common sense, and the mystic battle that would follow would surely exceed all logic and limitations of reality. As unnatural as it was, however, it was still a war, and as such, it obeyed certain relevant philosophies. One of them was the fact that the ones acting as vanguards were always the elite. Brave realm of splendor. Farewell, Valhalla. Let your proud castles, towering bastions, all crumble to ruin. Using the river of corpses as his trail, Wolfgang Schreiber dashes he let out a maddened howl. As the one who boasted the greatest speed, Albedo surged ahead of everyone else as though it were his privilege. It was followed by Machina and Beatrice, creating a vanguard lineup no one could find fault with. Farewell, resplendent pomp of the gods! Farewell! May you find rapture in your end, O、oh、race of immortals! This was proven by their abject lack of negligence. They went all out from the get go. Schreiber's speed grew higher and higher until it became a thousand times greater than the speed of sound and beyond. Not a soul in this world was capable of catching up to him. Even if he faced light instead of the dark, he'd break the laws of the world and outspeed even that. That was the nature of the beast's craving. <laughs> and it was now unleashed. The all devouring beast of the abyss! He was the fastest. None could catch him. The infamous wolf became a peerless shooting star that pierced Ludwig. But. I mean, if we're taking that, he's literally darkness, so. Methuselah remained unfazed. Even the hole Shriver had punched through his chest quickly closed. No, that description was off the mark. After all, this entity had no physical body. Shiraiba continued attacking even as Ludwig talked. During his creation figment, the beast was too maddened to hold a proper conversation. He wished to be faster, to outspeed anything. No matter the cost, he sought to achieve velocity that would make him absolutely untouchable. That was what he'd wished for his entire life, and it was his only weapon. By relying on his unmatched speed, he gave all. He gave his all to gouge, cleave, and tear his enemies apart. That was exactly what was happening to Ludwig, but all the wounds he was dealt instantly regenerated, which many would think is impossible. After all, the creation figment created a rule. 
It was a power that made one's idea pulverize all common sense, so obvious ideas such as the indestructibility of darkness shouldn't have applied to Shriver. In fact, Albedo might have actually been damaging him, but... So <laughs> his scale was too vast, his history too dense, meaning that Schreiber severely lacked the firepower to damage him. Even so, by no means that made it far fair to assume Schreiber was weak. A single knight was as large as half the world, and Methuselah had accumulated a countless number of them. No matter how quick the fang, there was a hit limit to the area it could tear. Thus, indeed, there was no denying that Albedo's attacks were keen to an ant to him. Oh, here comes Beatrice! Forgive me, for I have sinned, born of loyalty, your will I once defied. What was there to do then? Well, the answer took the form of the second vanguard. Forgive me, for I am not but a fool, never your equal. Let your crimson pyres have their fill. It was Beatrice. She dashed while bearing speed, second only to Schreiber's, as her body was gradually surrounded by lightning. There was more to come, however. Oh! Fare thee well, my dear bright child. Eleanor was supporting her subordinate from behind. Next to her, there was a so-called railway gun, fully operational. It released a humming sound akin to a growl. I'll present you with the most fervorous of flames. No bride shall ever be your equal. For he who fears the tip of my lance shall never pass through the river of flames. Her blade, body, soul, all of it became the lightning of the war god. It was a rule she'd craved and prayed for so that she could shine upon the darkest battlefields. She wanted to make sure none of her comrades would lose their way under the smoke-filled bloody sky. She wanted to help her beloved superior's ideals shine brilliantly. She wished to become a dark rending flesh, a battle maiden who would lead the heroes to glory, to Valhalla. <laughs> that pure hearted prayer of hers was her world. Riding the fire from the railway gun behind her, Beatrice Kerheisen made her transcendent shine. <laughs> Lightning I dance, for I am Valkyrie. The dark wasn't something you crushed, it was something you banished. Thus an explosion of light could surely diminish the darkness. Lightning and fire bloomed and danced in the air, beautifully tearing Methuselah's kingdom asunder. Oh god, I love this shit again. Oh god, he's speaking the ang he he's speaking the moon speak. However, light and dark were but two sides of the same coin. The stronger the light, the deeper the darkness. They heard a sound that came to something crawling out of the ground. Fittingly, it came from below. Just like what would happen with Gladsheim's roar, they were hit by their very own powers. Torrents of lightning and blaze burned hundreds of the castle's legion. Beatrice seemed to have expected as much, so she was able to evade just in time. Same went for Schreiber. As she grit her teeth in frustration, Ludwig appeared before them, looking as though nothing had happened to him. United Infantry, Volley Fire, Piercing Bayonet Stabs, Fiery Tank and battle shell, Battleship Shelling. None of it seemed to work. Even after the... Uh... Messerschmitt formation drowned him in machine gun fire, and Junker's Ju-88s repeatedly bombed him alongside Heinkel Heel 111s. The darkness remained supreme. Nothing they tried had any effect on him. 
追ってこようが駅などないと無駄な真似をさせるないなるべくなクラウディアを悲しませることはしたくないのよ You fucking hypocrite! You're already sand her by taking away her joy of being able to walk under the sun! As Ludwig spoke his unwillingness to fight, his tone grew dense with resignation. He had already given them his last warning and was fully aware that adding anything more to it would change nothing. At the very least, Beatrice and Reinhard would continue this fight no matter what. According to many warriors throughout the ages, heroes always tried to become the light that banished the chaotic darkness, but Ludwig claimed that it was the other way around. Hmm. The dark never gave birth to light after all. So the ones who were bringing the wars were none other than the fools who were baited by the light of glory. They wanted to shine so much that they plotted and designed a fitting stage. A world sunk into darkness. And yet, they failed to realize that their very warped light had created a darkness just as distorted. <laughs> Oh boy! Ooh, munch time! Suddenly, the night around Methuselah became heavier. There was a visible difference in darkness surrounding him. The shapes birthed by the darker hue were akin to fangs of beasts. The ones who defined the dark as something detestable were humans. Their instincts told them to fear it, and thus it became synonymous with dread. War, calamity, madness, death, all of that was evil and menacing. In a sense, those things were akin to mankind's predators. Thus, Ludwig was an amalgam of all phenomena that ravaged mankind. He had nearly countless means of murder, both physical and mental. The reason he hadn't launched many attacks so far was so surely because he hated the way he was. He felt as though he had been defiled, lamented the fact that the darkness, neither evil nor good at its core, had become such a ravenous poison. Therefore, he found showing such sides of him to be unbearable. Just like when he donned the skin of a vampire, he did not do it so willingly. Still, given the situation, there was no room for such restraint. <laughs> Ooh. The horde of jaws that spawned behind him gnawed loudly as they charged toward Gladsheim. A war for a war, as if he was showing the folly in their logic. Beatrice responded by further enhancing her body turned lightning and intercepted the enemy. No matter how menacing its form, the dark was still the dark. None of those claws or fangs could reach her if she merely shone brilliantly enough. That logic was sound. However, it only applied when the scale was uh, the same on both sides. Her lightning was eroded, painted over by the dominion of darkness. Soulful as it was, her light wasn't enough to make the encroaching jaws fade. This is all because each and every one of Ludwig's fangs had a hundred days worth of darkness compressed in them. The density of the phenomena was on a different level. 
After all, no one shut away in a cavern can light up the outside by merely turning on a light bulb. And due to similar logic, Beatrice and her f light were crushed. She screamed and released a flash, a splash of blood. Though she'd avoided a direct hit, the darkness had taken her entire left arm and it didn't end there. The Legion of the Night continued to push forward. Shriver was able to avoid them all, but the Battle Maiden, being already damaged, was incapable of fighting back. If she was swept away by the second wave of darkness, her light would be extinguished and not even her bones would remain. Eleanor tried to support her with more artillery fire, but alas, that wasn't enough. Methuselah's darkness would soon devour Beatrice whole. However, right before that happened... End of a mortal world! Yes! Something wrought of iron interfered. It pulverized the fangs of the dark in but a single hit, making their curtain fall upon them. That was the first win for Gladsheim's side. Their hopeless situation was changed with the power of a single man. Grimacing in pain, Beerus looked up at his back. He didn't say anything, but he was without a doubt standing there with the majesty of a champion. He'd forgotten his name and desired only to die in the greatest of battlefields, and that was what made him the manifestation. Or rather, the end that he was. His craving was to make the curtain fall on his Volsunga Saga, and its effect as a power was to end all phenomena, regardless of whether they had a shape or not. Any story with any sort of history would have an ending, and his deus ex machina instantaneously and forcefully moved the story to that conclusion. Not only could it affect living beings and buildings, it could also end fire, lightning, and even thoughts and concepts. Being struck by his punch meant having his history ended, and not even the dark divinity was an exception. A single punch would shatter him and make him vanish. Oh. Buddy, I can literally flick your forehead and wipe you out of existence. Do you want to try me? Ludwig sighed in both wonder and shock as he instantly understood the nature of Machina's power. Since death was mankind's greatest darkness, it wasn't difficult for him to realize. Bitch, do I look like I care? His voice was silent, but his answer concise and clear. He hadn't hit he hadn't a single hint of doubt regarding himself. If, only, if he'd only pulverized the concept of personified nature, Ludwig would simply lose his arcane and return to mere darkness like the rest of his kin. That would be an appropriate conclusion, but Machina's fists would surely go beyond that. He would certainly end the very existence of darkness itself, and it didn't take much to know just how badly that would damage the world the Order. And yet the man wasn't concerned about or interested in that whatsoever. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. <laughs> the man was dead to begin with. Since all of creation would eventually return to nothingness, he had no qualms about creating the void, and that was the very reason why he was the transcendence of the ending. The darkness surrounding Ludwig underwent another huge change. It was different than the last one because of its number and regularity. It was the first attack if the first attack was an onslaught of beasts, this was more, far more like a line of troops standing ready to fire. In the sky, there was a geometrical pattern of unmatched accuracy. Standing in front of it, Methuselah continued. Cool. 
前のようなものには何の値打ちもないのだよ。消えて不都合がない存在とは、要するにお前だな、黒騎士よ。Suddenly, the elaborate muzzle behind him fired a single gathering of darkness. It burst right before Machina's eyes, becoming spherical and encircling him. Then it began to shrink with the purpose of crushing him. Of course, Machina wouldn't have been Nigrido if he was incapable of handling such a trifling attack. Our time, motherfucker! His all shattering fist pulverized the dark prison. It was an obvious result, and Ludwig had expected it. And exactly because he knew this would happen, he didn't end it there. Soon came the second one, then the third, fourth, fifth, etc. And like ceaseless gunfire, the darkness shrouded him completely. Though Machina was shattering each and every one of them, the number of spheres greatly outmatched the speed at which he could swing his fists. His situation was the equivalent of being continuously enclosed by countless paper thin walls. He could easily break them, but he was incapable of ending all the separate spheres simultaneously. If Schreiber's weakness against Ludwig was his lack of destructive ability, Machina's weakness was the limit of his speed. Everyone watched dumbfounded as he was sectioned off by the pitch black spheres of darkness that showed no sign of ending. There were hundreds, thousands of them. No one dared to count them, but the firing was done in only about 10 seconds. 1,400 years worth of nights. Holy shit! Machina was probably still fighting within the dark engulfing him, but no one on the outside could know his state. Machina basically had to throw 500,000 Deus Ex Machinas, and he had to do it while surrounded by a crushing darkness, unaware of which way was up, down, left, or right. He could easily shatter all of them, all of the many condensed knights, simultaneously by simply landing a hit on their origin, Methuselah. But that was exactly why Ludwig discarded the necessary amount of darkness. Just as he'd said, it was a millennia and 400 years worth of knights. 500,000. As such, Machina had no choice but to destroy them separately. This dude's pretty fucking strong. Dude, don't fucking underestimate Machina. He went through hell to gain his power. He went through a goddamn gauntlet. Machina and Schreiber's prayers, their cravings, both changed their very selves into other worlds. Since they were transcendence types, their influence on the current world was limited, but it wasn't entirely non-existent. They counted as foreign entities and thus couldn't last long. Things would be different if they descended to the stage that made them gods, but that wasn't the case, so they had their limits. He paused and formed a smirk before continuing. Lightly snapped his fingers as if to shoo away a bug, making the dark prison King Machina fly away like a bullet. It went towards the end of the visible sky beyond the horizon. <laughs> With that, Machina was forced to withdraw from the battle. Just as Ludwig had said, even if he returned, the battle would be long over. Not only that, but as one of Gladsheim's residents, Machina shared his lot with Reinhard. He was destined to vanish if his master faced defeat. Thus, no matter which angle you looked at it from, Nigrodo had definitely dropped out of the fight, meaning that they'd lost what might have been the only card they could play against Methuselah. Shriver was still attacking him, but just like before, the damage he dealt was negligible. Beatrice was injured, while the rest were greatly fatigued. Oh, 
Rusalka had exceptionally bad combatability with him. Her world let her manipulate shadows, but when facing Methuselah, doing so was nothing but suicide. Her actions were limited, but there was little she could do about the situation. Same went for Lisa, Spine, and Kane. None had any means that could prove effective against such a fearsome foe. The one doing the most was Eleanor, and even she was only marginally better than Beatrice. She lit up the Dark Knight to minimize the damage to her side, but that was the most she could manage. Things might have changed for the better if she used her creation figment, but the risks that came with that were far too great. Not only did she have no proof that it could work, but she would also kill all of her comrades. That was the nature of her world, and though she never hesitated to use it if it was necessary, in this situation, it was a pointless act that came to tying her own neck. <laughs> Yeah, like, I, I know she's, yeah, it, it's, it's a bit too risky for her to pull out the attack where it'll constantly encompass until it finally fucking hits you. It's way too risky in this situation. Then it shall be so. He added as he spread his wings and chanted. The obsidian table's claws and fangs instantly ready themselves for whatever was to come, but nothing seemed to have changed. As they began to think Ludwig had failed, his arcane suddenly bore its fangs. Oh! Rusalka's legs became as salt and shattered. Then it was her fingers, arms, shoulders, all of it decayed and crumbled. <laughs> The abnormality spread in but a blink of an eye. Though the extent of it was different for each one of them, all of their bodies were falling apart. Even the horde of the dead that made up Gladsheim were starting to shatter at one side. Tanks and aircraft began to rust and fall to the ocean while disintegrating. And to make it towards the spread of the, the speed of this disaster only continued to increase. It was a total collapse. Annihilation was drawing near. Damn! That's made a clock sound effect. Did he rapidly speed up time on some people? I mean, hell, it's even affecting Reinhardt! Though Reinhardt was still as composed as he sounded, a crack had appeared on his cheek. It didn't do more than that to him, but evidently not even he was free from the effects of the mysterious attack. That alone made it abundantly clear just how powerful a magic Ludwig had was exercising. But what exactly was its nature? これは時間か。さあよ。目と白が歩んできた夜を高速で回しているあまりに早すぎるため自覚するのは難しいが、体は常に正直だ。風化が始まっているのだよ。Fault of time for thou art fair. The Obsidian Table sought immortality and indestructibility, and that very fact meant that they'd yet to achieve it. At that point in time, not even Reidharn was an exception. Though death had didn't come to them easily, they would obviously break if they were forced to bear a great burden, such as an age's worth of time. まだ肉体面にしか作用しておらぬから耐えているのだ哀れにも察してしまえばどうなるか自主衝動に潰されたら確かにそうだ気づくが魂が朽ちるだろうま私以外の者に部下を壊させるわけにもいかんのは事実
Reinhardt stroked his hair upward, his hand momentarily hit his cracked cheek, and after me moved it away, the injury had vanished as if it was never there in the first place. He then glanced at Mercury, who didn't seem to be affected whatsoever. <laughs> Either force him to adhere to your own logic or make him scatter with all the might we have. Mercurius acknowledged the idea. So the gold, as the commander of his legion, gave the decision. どうした今だ腰を上げる気にはならんのかハイドリヒお前も脱水銀私を消したいなら自ら舞台に上がるがいい Upon hearing Ludwig's words, the two leaders of the city and table formed wry grins, which seemed to imply that they really wanted to do as he said. <laughs> he found the word strange, hard to comprehend even. They made sense, but what they implied was impossible. Ludwig knew full well he was referring to, but he couldn't see the meaning of acting on his words. The man in question already perished, and even the off chance that he did survive, there was nothing he could do, so... Don't underestimate him. The moment he assumed he just misheard the words, a sudden storm of night-rending thorns erupted toward him! <laughs> I destroyed him, twisted him apart, tore him to pieces and pulverized him. Then I threw him away. If I didn't think that could be called a fighting style, that was the best description for it. I trampled my enemies with all my might, leaving them as a little more than undignified gore. I knew pretty damn well that I was being crude and brutish. I mean, by that point, I had a general idea for how normal people viewed things. What of it, though? Sure, I didn't give a shit about society's standards, but I wasn't purposefully trying to stray away from them either. If anything, it just so happened that my style fit a certain template. It definitely wasn't like I was just some little brat trying to look cool by doing bad things. This is just a matter of what I preferred and what I was good at. Going wild simply felt right to me, and I couldn't do things any other way. There's something that had become a part of me during the nights I'd spent hunting cats and dogs. I believed it was normal for people to be good at what they like doing, and the reverse is true as well. I was good at fighting using my style, and it gave me the best results, so I naturally came to enjoy it. Summer! Sup, bitches! You forgot I was dead! You thought I was dead? I especially liked warping the mugs of guys that pissed me off, like the fucker before me. Hell, I could say I was pretty much born to do it. Yes. With the roar, I unleashed a volley of sticks that polarized this damn darkness. Thanks to that, the guys at the back were safe from the brink of death, if only barely. Oh,なんだてめえら。ちょっと見ねえ間にドイツもババッチくなるやらって。みっともねえだろ、下がったろ。あの野郎は俺がやる。I had no intention of handing him over to anyone else. I had to return the favor. And fuck, we just had a pretty damn weird connection, so the battle was mine to fight. I wouldn't take a no or even give them the time to offer it. I 
broke the approaching jaws of my fist. That blew in my arm, but it instantly regenerated. The scene before him filled with shock. As it was, his face was hard to read, but the confusion was still pretty damn obvious. <laughs> it was a testament just how taken aback he was. Bloodstained roses, baby! An eruption of deadly thorns, thoroughly covered in briar. I spun as I turned myself into a bullet and flew toward him, breaking his defense like a battering ram and charging at him. It wouldn't have been a proper battle between us if it didn't start with this punch. I tried to get in three times already and failed, but I was sure this baby would land properly. I mustered all my strength and punched him with just as much. My fist finally reached his dumb fucking face. From the feeling alone, I could tell that it was heavy. He didn't sidestep it or take it just for some sloppy act. In exchange for landing that one, about half my body was eaten away by the dark fangs. But like the four, the wounds is regenerated. Even the damage was fatal, didn't mean shit to me. <laughs> yes. The gold souls were flowing into me, becoming my flesh and blood. This was a reward and a blessing I'd received from Lord Hydric. And I was told that it'd last for that single battle alone. The Legion of Gladsheim was refilling me with a limitless supply of life. That was the sole reason why I was such a good state despite I almost died back at the cathedral. Dude, yes! All my wounds disappeared instantaneously and all my attacks were the strongest I could muster. Because of that, I didn't need any forethought. I burned all 8,000 souls I could store with every hit I made. Both my defense and offense were on a whole different level. Sure, it was a limited reward, but I couldn't help but savor the taste of glory that would eventually be fully mine. After all, this was what it meant to be an Ainuyar. It was the privilege I'd get if I was summoned to Valhalla and became a part of Lord Hydric. <laughs> Damn. That was probably the reason why Samuel hadn't eaten all that many souls. She'd been planning to become an immortal champion since the very start, so she'd always rejected the souls she'd found trifling. She wanted to have a truly glorious formation made up of only the most worthy elite. In her mind, bringing pathetic souls to Gladsheim was an act of disloyalty. And it was so like her that I could only laugh! Though, I wasn't diligent enough to do what she did. I knew a thing or two about pride, so I'd do my best to meet their expectations. The process of linking me to Gladsheim took a while and made me late. And that was exactly why I had to make up for it by stealing all the most juicy scenes. <laughs> we passed each other and dealt immense damage. My side was pierced while his arm was blown away. The parts that were ours mixed in the world in midair and vanished into the emptiness with a sound reminiscent of a death wail. Oh, that looks so good! Ugh. The moment after, just as before, we both regenerated. <laughs> He'd obviously realized that I had access to Gladsheim's soul supply, but that alone wasn't enough to harm him. As much as I resented the fact, it was true that my caliber wasn't that great. If slapping 8,000 souls on this guy was enough to damage him, Schreiber would have been able to do it too, so that couldn't be it. 
If Methuselah can only be broken by quality, quantity, and status, the only one among us would be capable as Lord Hydric. It'd be a battle of the kings, which wasn't something I could mimic. Of course, I couldn't pull off Machina's speed either. As one who wished for an eternal life, Willem Ehrenberg could never lose the concept of the end. You wonder why I can hit him then? Like I said, I ain't telling. At least not until we get to the point where this guy realized it. Not until we get to the point where I get to ridicule his dumbfounded face and punch it real good. I never sighted anything high and noble from battle. I punched and broke the mugs of anyone I wanted and found it all refreshing. Seagull and all that shit. Because of that, I never held back. I went in with all I had and killed all I was. That was my very own form of chivalry. My path is a knight. My briar is high with more mouths than a machine gun that mowed down thousands. By that point, they're more like a forest ravaging the Arctic. Anyone looking from the side would see nothing but madness. I didn't activate the Night of the Bloodstained Roses. Don't misunderstand, though. Like I said, I was going all out. I wasn't underestimating him, and I know, and I had proper reasons for keeping it sealed. Hmm. Uh... Oh, okay, that's why. My main purpose behind unleashing the night was to drain my surroundings and grow stronger. But since I had glad time support, I didn't really need it. Additionally, making the night denser while fighting Ludwig was too risky. I was confident that it could that it wouldn't be used against me, but still, with its main purpose already fulfilled, I just had no reason to unleash it. The third and biggest reason was the fact that unleashing Helga's will wasn't a good idea given the situation. Situation? Eh, like I said, I ain't telling. Hmm. Just know that I had to wield this destruction with all my power while at the same time doing some pretty delicate work. Basically, if I let out the core of my mind, everything could go to shit. And so I had to keep Helga in check. I took the fuel from Gladsheim and used it to wield her power without restraint while also doing my best to prevent her from waking. And I tell you, it was like walking a damn tightrope. Hey, yeah, I'm not going to hold you back. Have out of him. I'd lead this battle to our victory. That was the conclusion I sought, and I was far more serious about than ever. Ah, I had no reason to let him finish a line that had probably pissed me off, so I didn't. I bent all the muscles in me about making my body twist like a drawn bow. I forced all my power into my next strike. I wanted to become a blood-sucking demon. A murderous, tyrannical aesthetic in the immortal phoenix of the night will rebirth himself by draining the lives of others. If we thought my craving was stale and that I had mistaken upbringing, I didn't need his lineage or name. Parasite was the true path I'd take if I wanted to be myself. My roots returned to ash. I do it, I done it once, and I do it again. <laughs> Dark and dark clash in the air. The impact produced no light, but our eyes could see a flash of the abyss. To my mind, it was good enough to be called a spark. The scattered darkness was taken by the gale and flew away like stardust riding the storm. The still spinning eternal night was not focused exclusive on me. I had no idea how many thousands of years had passed by that point, but it didn't mean shit to me even if it was over a fucking million. I would revive endlessly even if my limbs crumbled and became dust. That was the vampirism I sought. I wouldn't and couldn't die. I wanted to become something that lived on no matter how many millions or billions of years went by. And even if the stars of the universe vanished. Fucking glorious! Screams we unleashed didn't even constitute his words. Still, the sentiment within them was obvious. 
condensed murderous intent. We broke and shattered each other, intertwining but not mixing. We bore our fangs with pride, as if fighting over who is the real darkness, the Methuselah among us. Damn right it was me! I was a true ancestor, and he, whatever the fuck he was, was a mere eyesore. As though overtaking the fragments of sound, torn and ripped apart, we fought boisterously while drawing a helix in the cracking atmosphere. Jesus. We traced the huge tornado that appeared and sped upward, high enough to break the yoke of gravity, and still accelerated, becoming faster with every moment. Mocking it. Defeat wasn't an option. The only one who never won against me was Lord Hydric. That was true at the time, and it wouldn't change for all eternity. To make sure that it remained so, I shattered him, regenerated him, broke him as I reached for victory and tried to pick up the scent of blood. Adia, where are you? That was when it happened. Oh. Ooh. Hello. Ludwig lost his temper and chose to use his arcane powers. The entire sky around us was shattered in a dark aurora. It was a scene of overwhelming ruin and it felt like a sign of a supreme calamity. Like a tsunami that could sink an entire continent. I was certain that this harbinger of cataclysm was the ace up his sleeve, but... Formation. That didn't mean shit to me. I just snapped my fingers and grasped the proof of my victory. The dark gift. <laughs> gotcha, bitch! Ludwig absentmindedly looked down at the shining briar, briar growing out of him. He clearly had no idea what just happened. Of course he wouldn't. This was a phenomenon that had happened out of his sight. He was just unlucky, and that was exactly why it was such a strong trump card for me. A set of minor details stacked and made up a flow attaining irreversibility as it headed toward the only possible conclusion. That was probably what Mercurius would say about it. And it was easy to see Ludwig as an idiot who just got what he deserved. After all, it wasn't impossible to expect this turn of events. Oh my god! That's right, she did she did lick up a little bit of his blood, so holy shit, dude! Oh yeah, there's a little bit of me inside you. How's that feel? He seemed to have finally realized. This is all just a blood pact. Despite donning the skin, the logic of a vampire, he took it lightly. It was what led to his defeat. No matter how little of the kiss in the dark she took, the fact remained that she'd taken my fangs inside her. The light, the peerless sun, he defined Claudia as such and that inter interrelation became permanent. This is just the result of all his smug talk about darkness being powerless before. Thus, through Claudia, I was able to counter Ludwig's attacks. That was the logic behind why I could match Methuselah, who completely dominated the rest of the Obsidian Table. Makes sense? In a sense, I was fighting with Claudia's powers. She was also one of the reasons why I didn't use the Night of the Bloodstained Roses. If Helga's consciousness had become too strong, the already faint blood tap pact would have been cut off. She hated Claudia, she, so she probably done with Lee. Love only me. Look only at me. You don't need anyone else and all that jazz. And if that happened, I wouldn't have won this perfectly winnable battle. 
God damn, Wilhelm. He called me shallow, and I had no idea just how much depth he had himself, but. Like, he's brash, but he's not fucking stupid. People, those wielding magic and demon gods were no exception. With that, I revealed everything I had, which meant the end of this farce was near. I only wouldn't explain the situation to set up what would happen next. There was a line I really wanted. I fucking wanted to tell him. So I raised my fist, ready to make him cry real good. <laughs> Those words, I sunk my fist into his face, blew him away, and retrieved Claudia. Then... There's your thing, boss. Have at it. Covenant, the holy spear of destiny. The golden light overflowed as the universe compressed into a spear materialized itself from within Lord Hydric's hands. This was the true, unquestionable manifestation of divinity, and it needn't be said where its tip was directed. Methuselah, the one said to be the last arcane, had gotten the better of him through logic, and Lord Hydric would blast him away with sheer power. Hegemony, kingship, the unwavering love of destruction. He'd absolutely outdone the enemy on both possible fronts, and thus. He's a Who can I? Hey, have at it, boss! Not even millions of knights could withstand the direct all destroying power. There's a light that seemed to purge the old law and give birth to a new world. Like a waterfall, the golden torrent washed away all the darkness. Ludwig screamed as he faded. It was no longer Methuselah. Everyone present felt the ancient arcane evaporate with the blinding strike of the Holy Lance, leaving behind nothing but simple darkness. Eventually, there would only be the shapeless, untalkative, unremarkable aspect of nature. With this, the mysterious events that continued since Kachin would finally get some closure. Indeed, all that stuff was clearly over, but... Dude. Hand reached out from the light and grabbed my shoulder, or rather, Claudia, who I held within my hands. Shattering just, just how unbelievable it was. This guy was still allowed not only after getting done in by me, but even after taking a direct hit from Lord Hydrick's Holy Lance. And again, he might have already been dead. He just had the will and tenacity that would let him reject his demise to regardless. Okay, let me tell you, that was the first time something other than Lord Hydrick or Mercurius made me feel fear. <laughs> He then mustered his strength. With power that greatly surpassed my expectations, he pulled me and Claudia and sent us tumbling through the air. We began falling, intertwined. The three of us were at the mercy of gravity and fell toward the surface. We eventually broke through the clouds and I opened my see a vast cold wasteland, an expanse of snow and ice. I can only assume that it was the paradise he once talked about, but I didn't really give a shit. <laughs> we were extremely high and went down stupidly fast. There was no way Claudia would survive the fall. I'd experienced fear for the third time in my life just a mere moment ago, and then came the fourth. Yeah. It scared me. The idea that I would lose Claudia made me tremble with fear. 
これはこれはなかなか飽きさせぬ展開だな。いいえな、むしろ王道と言うべきか。理屈で破れ、力で破れ、しかしまだまだ負けていない。最後に残ったのは男の狂気。愛しい女を手にするためいざ魂の決闘に臨んでみせるとつまり我々の見立てが甘かった取るべき勝利は2本にあらず3本あったというわけだ Mercurius looked down on the scene while exuding an air of irresponsibility similar to that of a member of the audience in a theater Even if the situation was dire, he'd said whatever he wanted despite not doing anything to help. This attitude of his was one of the reasons why he was so disliked by many. <laughs> After responding to the nonchalant magician, Reinhardt undid the formation of his lance and threw a glance downward before continuing his words in a dispassionate tone. <laughs> これで終わったあとは彼らの個人的な問題だろう故に引き上げだベイも生きていれば戻ってこよう完全勝利の是非についてはこのまま委ねることとする Basically let it be known that Gladsheim fueled Bay is god damn powerful 今さら部外者の立ち入りは下世話というものだろうし、うん、確かにそれはそのとおり。Mercury seemed somewhat disappointed, but it was hard to tell how serious he was. Before they left as Reinhardt ordered, he gave the man another question. どうでしたかな、メトシェラは He'd asked whether Reinhardt was satisfied. Mercurius's tongue contained a sentiment impossible to measure through words alone. <sighs> That accursed foreknowledge! ほんのれがどういうものと相対するのか怒りの人はどんな地形を目指しているのかこたびのことでそこを感じ取ってもらえればそれでいいのだつまりおおむね有意義な戦だったと表現できるそれは上々 Thus, on to the next one, the next. The end of the phenomena they both fixed their eyes upon was far off in the distant horizon. They were already spending far too much time at this scene. They had to keep moving, never stopping, no matter what. Christophe <laughs> Reinhardt looked down on his dying subordinates once more. His eyes were filled with love, and he blessed their future with naught but sincerity. He was dreaming of the ideal land of strife he would arrive upon after this eternity of destruction and battle. Oh boy! I want to record more, but I hope it hasn't been picking up on the current recording, but for some reason I've been getting some really bad allergy reactions, so I, uh, I apologize on that behalf, but if you all like this, be sure to let me know. I'm sorry that we're kind of ending it here on a sort of pseudo cliffhanger, but I am doing everything in my power not to sneeze and sniffle, and I think it might have picked up a little a few times on the recording, and I'm, I'm sorry. I think we might be able to wrap this up either next episode or the episode after, but damn. Seeing Wilhelm just being fueled by the power of Gladsheim was, it, that was arguably the fucking coolest thing I think I've ever seen so far in this. Not, 
Not entirely Deus Irae, but so far in this novel. Just, I, admittedly, I wasn't expecting, you know, just fucking Reinhardt be like, Hey, you want a taste of my power? Here you go. I was not expecting that. <laughs> but damn, was it freaking cool. I mean, hell, he was at a level where he didn't have to use formation until it really mattered. That was... Or, sorry, he didn't have to use Bria. He just... That was fucking good. Also, it was very clever using the blood of his that had... That Claudia had linked up. That was actually very fucking clever. It kind of makes me realize, wait a minute. He didn't even realize that she had taken in some of his blood. That's... <laughs> or Methuselah hadn't realized it. That's pretty fucking good. All right, um, again, I apologize that I'm ending it here, but if you all like this, be sure to let me know. I feel like we're probably going to finish this little confrontation between the two of them in the next episode or the episode after. We'll have to wait and see. But if you all like this, be sure to let me know. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will definitely see all of you guys in the next video. I love this. <laughs>